What's up, guys? Uh, forgive the no makeup, wet hair thing. I just got out of the shower and I'm gonna let my hair dry because I have to straighten it in a little while. But uh, today's video is gonna be more like informational. Um, I had a lot of trouble finding out about this uh, bladder disorder that I have. There wasn't that much information on it, like on YouTube and such. So I thought I'd make a video and talk about it because A, I think it'd be helpful for other people who have it and have questions about different treatments. And B, it's way more common than people think and a ton of people go undiagnosed uh, their whole lives, men and women. And they have this bladder disorder basically that's um, a pain in the ass, quite frankly. So what it's called, the technical term for it is interstitial cystitis. And that's really hard to say as someone who used to have a really bad lisp and still struggles with that a little bit. But it's called interstitial cystitis. The nickname for it is painful bladder syndrome. But the reason it is a cystitis, I guess you could say, is basically the wall of my bladder, or anyone who has this disorder, is covered in tiny little cysts, like hundreds of them, thousands of them, however many. And what I call it is sort of acid reflux of the bladder in that a lot of the foods that you avoid if you have acid reflux, very acidic foods, spicy foods, things like that, can flare your bladder up, can make those little cysts irritated and they swell, which makes your bladder like Mine, I think they said, gets to like half the size of a normal bladder. So then you have, you know, pain and you've got frequency like crazy. Um, before I had an implant in that I'm gonna talk about, I was going to the bathroom like 20, 30 times a day. I mean, it was ridiculous. Waking up all night, having to go to the bathroom, just always had bladder issues my whole life. And so, I guess I'll start from when I was little and sort of talk about the things, the treatments that I've had and when I got diagnosed and what has helped me because it's really under control pretty well now. So I will just get into that now. So I've had bladder issues since before I can remember, honestly. When I was very little, I wet the bed. I mean, I wet the bed through, I think like elementary school because of this disorder and I'll explain a little later why that is um, and a lot of kids could have this too it makes a lot of sense when you have kids who are bedwetters but they're not going during the day or going before bed they have a lot of trouble going sorry about that my camera fell I already had um, so I had surgery when I was four I believe I think that was the first time I had any surgery on my bladder or anything um, serious to look at it because I had already had multiple urinary tract infections by that time in my life. I'm like four or five years old. And I constantly had them, had burning, had frequency, had pain, wetting the bed, not able to go during the day. I mean, it was just constant. So they decided to do a surgery on my bladder. I was really young, so of course I don't remember the details of it. I do remember going under anesthesia and being high as hell. So, I believe what they did, and I could be totally wrong, but the common thing to do for bladder disorder of any type, um, sort of like if you have an issue like with your knee or something and the doctor can't really figure it out by imaging and such, they'll go in with a scope. So like a water surgery where they pump you full of water and it's very minimal, but basically they stick a camera in you. And if it's for your bladder, they stick it through your urethra, which is not fun, but you're asleep for the procedure. They stick a camera in there, they flood your bladder full of water, and they stretch it out um, to sort of help with that pressure feeling and the frequency. So they stretch it out and take images to make sure you don't have anything crazy going on, whatever. And usually for females, they check your ovaries and stuff to make sure you don't have any cysts on your ovaries, which luckily I've never had knock on wood but so that was the first time I had a surgery and then growing up I still dealt with it my whole life I mean I always had UTIs was always going to the doctor 
to get back on antibiotics or you know on some other medication and I remember being at the doctor's office and they have they always have to take a urine sample when you suspect you have a UTI and I remember not being able to go at all we would be there for an hour just waiting for me to pee and I felt like I had to pee I definitely had stuff in my bladder but I would sit there and my parents would like run the sink um, in the bathroom to try and like get my brain to want to go I think as a kid they probably really thought it was more psychosomatic if that's the correct word for that they thought it was probably in my head which makes sense when you're dealing with a child who is just not going but I just remember crying saying it hurt and I couldn't go and it was just awful and basically that was my whole childhood with my bladder issues um, as a teen I think it got a little bit better but I was still having UTIs like crazy I mean way more than the average person and still using the bathroom like crazy basically what I learned as an adult was that along with the interstitial cystitis and this typically goes hand in hand with people who have IC um, I also have pelvic floor dysfunction so the muscles in my pelvic floor area which is like right around your bladder right around your urethra will spasm and just like be rock hard like just from pain basically they're reacting to the pain in the bladder I guess and so as a kid when I was trying to go to the bathroom all the time and I couldn't go during the day but then I was wetting the bed at night it turns out I was like having full-on spasms that were completely closing up my urethra and I could not go to the bathroom I've had this happen to me as an, as an adult too, and I actually have catheters at home. Um, let's see if I can find one right here. Yeah, I've got a whole bag of them. As a kid, we thought it was just in my head and that I was, you know, just being stubborn or whatever. But as an adult, I learned what it was and that physically I could not go because it was spasming. So now, if that problem occurs again, I have catheters at home, which is not fun at all. And usually when you do one, you're almost guaranteed to get a UTI. This is sterile, but I mean, I'm not in a sterile area. You know what I mean? I don't have sterile gloves at my leisure. I just try and not touch it as much as I can. And you just have to put a little bit of like iodine lubricant on it and lubricant on it and just figure it out. And it's not fun. It hurts like hell. It hurts like hell to take out, but you can empty your bladder. And I haven't had to use one in a year or more, luckily. But every once in a while, I get this really bad bladder attack, I guess you could call it, and I have to use one, and it sucks. And after high school, it started to get worse again. So it was in 2010, I believe it was. They did um, another one of the um, water surgeries. What the bladder one is called is a hydro distension. Um, so they go in again, fill it up with water, stretch it out, and take pictures. So when I got that hydro distension in 2010, that doctor diagnosed me with interstitial cystitis and gave me all sorts of information on how to change my diet, how to cut out certain foods, how to, you know, just do certain lifestyle changes to help with the pain. And the hydro distension helped me for a couple years. Sometimes you can get like a month of relief of it and sometimes you can get a few years of relief. It's hit or miss. I've had it all over the spectrum. So I had that done. I think I had about two years of relief and then I started getting UTIs like crazy again. And I went to another doctor who specialized. I think that other doctor had left the practice or something. So I went to um, another doctor and she did the hydro distension for me again. And that time, I believe I got about a year of relief out of it and went back, was having the problems again. She sent me to physical therapy. So I did physical therapy for pelvic floor dysfunction. And that is some of the most awkward physical therapy there is, let me tell you. Because, I mean, they basically have to find these pressure points in your pelvic wall and apply a ton of pressure and they would use like vaginal dilators to try and just help those muscles stretch out a little bit and relax so yes there was a woman who had to sit on a 
like doctor bed examination table. She had to sit down there and basically like massage me down there. It was not pleasurable at all. It was very awkward, but she was really great about making me feel comfortable about it. And we would just talk about other stuff, whatever. And she helped me really understand all the different levels of muscles that are in your pelvic floor sort of like in your arm you've got you know layers of muscle that lay over the other ones so she taught me a lot about that uh, pelvic floor therapy was then put in conjunction with pelvic floor injections which hurt like a motherfucker uh, the first time I went and got these injections done basically they inject those pressure points um, in your vaginal wall. They inject with a big ass needle, one of the biggest needles I've ever seen in my fucking life. Um, they inject like anti-inflammatory, they put some numbing stuff on it, you know, whatever. Um, I forget all the, I think there was like a steroid or something. I forget the mixture that it was because it's been years since I had this done. But the first time I had it done, my best friend went with me and I think I almost passed out because it hurt so bad. I was just, I've never been in that much pain. So I only had to do those actually two or three times because then at that point, I think I had already had three or four hydro distensions done and that's in my whole life. So the one when I was four, the one in 2010, and then I think I had one, maybe two more. And whichever one had been the most previous one, it only lasted a month. And I mean, I paid for surgery, I paid for the facility fees, I paid for the anesthesia, paid out the ass for the surgery, and I only got a month of relief. I was pissed. Well, at that point, basically we had done almost every treatment that was offered at my clinic, and my urologist did specialize in interstitial cystitis, so she was really great about, you know, if you need to go to this place, let me send you out here if they didn't do it in office. I did just about everything except for Botox. Apparently you can get Botox injections and that can also help with the pain. I don't know how it works, if it just relaxes the muscles, whatever. But I didn't want any more shots down there because that's not fun. So what I looked into was called the inner stem and it's a nerve stimulator that they attach, they put it in your back. I have it in my back now had it for a few years now, two or three years. What was really cool about the inner stem, my favorite thing about this, was that you get to try it out before they actually cut you open and put it in you. So they put just the wire in your back and the wire is literally coming out of your back to an external battery pack that you wear for like two weeks or nine days or something like that. And then you have to keep track of how often you're going to the restroom and if it, significantly, if it significantly gets lower and lower, the number of how many times you're going and my pain also decreased, then you can go forward with getting the actual surgery. Day one or, it was like day two of having the trial one in, I like was going only like 10 times a day and that was from like 25 times a day. And so that was amazing. My pain was gone. All the pelvic floor like spasms were gone. It felt amazing. And I was like, yes, I'm definitely getting this implant. So getting that trial thing was an experience in its own. Um, they didn't put me under, like under, under sedation, but they gave me twilight sedation, which is, I think it was basically just a ton of like, Oh, what was it that she said they were giving me? Some sort of pain medication that just dopes you up. Like, it wasn't Demerol or anything like that. It was something like Percocet or something, but it was IV Percocet or whatever it was. And I was like pretty high when they gave it to me. I was feeling pretty good. And they had me laid down, face down on a table. And basically they had to stick they injected my back a bunch with numbing stuff, which hurt like hell. And I was so high that I couldn't help but like whimper. I wasn't like screaming or anything like that, but I just remember being like, ow, <laughs> like just kind of crying. And everybody at that office was so nice. I mean, all the women in there were like rubbing me, going, you're doing great. Like they were holding my hand. I mean, they were fantastic. I could not have gotten like a better group of people to be there with me while that was happening. Um, but she had to inject me a few times for numbing 
and then she had to put the wire in my back and plug it into my spine basically into your spinal cord so the nerves in your spinal cord and somehow I don't know how this works but somehow that nerve when there's stimulation to it which is what my implant does and I have a remote for it I'm going to show you in a second but somehow this stimulation they have found in your sacral nerve, I believe it is, it's somewhere down near your sacral nerve, um, affects your bladder frequency. It also affects pain. However, they haven't been approved to code it for that. So you can't go in and say, I need the understand because I'm having pelvic floor dysfunction pain. You can only get it if you're having major frequency. And then it happens to also help the pain some weird thing that they're trying to fix because a lot of people are getting pain relief from it so they're trying to see if they can do it just for people who have pelvic floor dysfunction as well but it was really cool and it's really crazy and I'll, I'll see if I can film this actually because it's so weird looking um, but while I'm laying on the table and they have the wire in my back and they're trying to find the spot and then they're turning the nerve stimulator on which does not hurt it hurts if it's like really high but it just feels like a vibration sort of um, down in that area. Again, doesn't feel good. It's not that sort of vibration. It's more internal, but they know that they found the right spot by watching your feet movement. So my feet were laying off the table. I was face down. My feet were just dangling off like this. And when they found the right spot, one of my feet would like flex so my toes would like instead of my foot being pointed it would like go like that when they would turn the thing up it would just pull my foot up it would pull that muscle up whatever it was and then they would move it and see if they could get the other foot to move and then try and find the best spot like in between those two things so when I turn my dot my um when I turn my stimulator up really high my foot will actually flex a little bit and I can feel it in my toes and it's very weird um, but it's just this involuntary electric thing that happens, basically. So, um, after the, that surgery, they put it in my back, and again, it was plugged into an external battery pack that had a clip on it. I had to sleep with this thing. I mean, like, I had to shower with it, like, my husband had to hold it, or we put it, like, in a Ziploc bag or something. It was a pain in the ass. And I also couldn't bend over for, like a week I think it was because I could migrate the needle and the same thing after I got the actual implant because they pulled that needle out and put in a permanent one and I had to keep my body straight had to sleep straight like sit straight I couldn't sit for like two weeks because they didn't want the needle to migrate it had to basically fuse with my bone so that's in there permanently now so um with this device basically there's a wire and there's a little battery pack that's about this big and it's really flat when you when you hold it sideways it's really flat really thin it's just this silver little device and that's the battery and that is right now in my back sort of over where my right kidney would be i guess and sometimes you can feel it depending it's not that deep in there and every five to seven years, depending on how high I have it, how often I use it, which is constantly, most people use it constantly, but some people turn it off, whatever, or have it very low. But depending on how high you have it, um, the battery needs to be changed every five to seven years. So I'll have to go in and have another surgery and they'll just replace that battery part. They won't have to redo the wire unless it's migrated for some reason, but I don't think that it has because everything's still working in it. So, the only two things that I don't like about this implant are I cannot have any MRIs and I don't care about an MRI because I don't do very well whenever I have had to get MRIs. Like it freaks me out to have to sit perfectly still for as long as you have to for MRIs. However, I have this weird fear that I'm going to forget that I can't do an MRI and I don't know if you guys have ever had an MRI but it's magnetic resonance imaging and it's basically a huge really really strong magnet and if you know someone with a pacemaker they also are not allowed to have an MRI they have to have a CAT scan or a CT scan which is what it's called now and the reason is that huge magnet will rip it out of your damn body those things are strong as hell 
and I'm so terrified that I'm gonna forget because they usually don't ask people my age. They'll ask older people like, do you have a pacemaker or whatever? But they tend to forget when you're in your 20s and you're like, I like, I can't have an MRI. Like, oh yeah, by the way, and I'm so scared I'm gonna forget one day and this thing's gonna come flying out of my body. It's like my biggest fear. That's, one, that's number one that I don't think about it. But it's a small sacrifice. Like I haven't needed an MRI. I needed one for like my hip. I had a hip surgery a couple years ago that I had a tear in. But they were able to see the tear with the CAT scan. And they knew what it was from physical exams and everything. Just the way my hip was reacting, it made sense. So that was no big deal. Um, the other thing that I don't like, and apparently I'm one of like three people who has had this device and had this issue, and I don't know what it is. I figured it out recently. I used to think it was a shock that I was getting, but it's not. So when I go in and out of stores that have metal detectors, it, something in the metal detectors ramps up the power of my stimulator. So there's levels, and I'll show you, again, I'll show you the remote in a second but there's levels. And I noticed that when they check my battery life at the doctor's office, they put like the remote has to be over my back. It does the same thing. It like turns it up really high for a second and then it goes back to normal. So when I'm walking in and out of stores, I have to walk right in the center of the metal detectors because if I'm too close to one of them, I'll get that shocking feeling. And sometimes they're just too strong or sometimes they're really close together and there's no avoiding it and again they only said when I called the manufacturer and everything they were like we've only ever had a two other people that said that they have this issue and we don't know what it is the only thing we can recommend is that you walk between the middle of them so I'm hoping when I get my battery changed maybe it won't do it anymore I don't know but basically it look it always looks like I'm stealing something in stores because <laughs> I'm so scared to get shocked that I kind of run through the metal detectors, which does not look good when you're leaving a store. And so I try and get like right up to it and then kind of like skip over it or run through it as quick as I can. And every time I'm like, people, someone's, no one has ever stopped me and been like, what are you doing? But I'm always like, people are gonna think I'm stealing something, I'm running out of the store, but it's to avoid getting like the shock feeling. It's not fun. But again, that's a very rare thing. Um, they had to contact all different kinds of people who had never heard of this issue before and there was like one woman who had heard two other people had it. So it's very, very, very rare. But, and again, it's a small issue for what it's done for me. I have had so much relief from this thing. I don't go to the bathroom all the time. I still go a lot. I mean, probably for a normal person, but before I had it, it would like, basically with interstitial cystitis, sometimes it'll hit out of nowhere. Um, the best way to describe it is if you've had way too much to drink and suddenly you have to pee and you have to pee like now. Like it's so overwhelming, the pain and like the urge to go pee when you're drunk. That's what it feels like and it just hits you out of nowhere. The worst is if you're stuck in like rush hour traffic and it hits and you feel like you're about to pee yourself. It's so bad and you have to like pull over somewhere and go to the bathroom, it's the worst. So it's really helped getting rid of that. Now I can like, oh, I have to go to the bathroom. I can wait a minute. Like I've never had that luxury before. So that's insane. Not going as much, not having the pain, not having the pelvic floor dysfunction. I mean, it has helped all of that. Uh, with that being said, I guess I will show you guys the remote now. So I don't keep this with me. I just kind of keep it in like a drawer at home because I don't really have to mess with it. Um, every once in a while I do. If I get like a CAT scan or if I have a surgery or something, they tell me to turn it off. So I'll turn it off before then. And then over the next few days, I'll slowly get it back up to the level that I was on previously. It's got a big range of how strong the stimulation is. They give you this nice little pack with this little Velcro thing. I don't know what, you're gonna like wear it on your arm or something, I don't know. But I keep the batteries out of it so that they don't get drained because again, I never use this thing. So this is what it looks like. It has this cord. This is the remote that I control. And this is what I hold over where the actual implant is. So I'm gonna put the batteries in and I can kind of show you guys a little bit and see if I can get my foot to do that weird thing. If that stuff creeps you out, I'll warn you before I do it because my husband hates that, that kind of stuff, so I know some people do. So, yeah, it's turning on now. Let's 
gonna like just you know tell me basic stuff I don't even remember what my level is right now okay so it's asking me to sink so I'm gonna take this piece and I'm gonna hold it over where my implant is and I'm gonna hit this sink button on the side and I can feel it. It gives me the, the tiniest of little jolts in my back. So I just hold that over the device and it reads it. So I'm at a level 3.0. I don't know how high that is really. I don't know how high it goes. I wanna say it goes to like 10, but when I go up or down with this guy, it goes up, let's see here. It goes up 0.1, so that's 3.1. So I'll go back down to three. Three is a good level for me. I've had it on three for probably two years now. I don't think I've touched this thing in over a year. Um, so it's really awesome. Um, so when I need to turn it off for some reason, I always turn it all the way down before I turn it actually off. And when I turn it off, it's the weirdest feeling because I don't feel it normally. Like it is technically this vibration feeling almost, but I'm so used to it. I don't feel it at all. When I turn it off, my body feels weirdly still, like I'm dead or something. Like it, it creeps me out to have it off almost because then it's just weird. But I'll turn it all the way down because when I turn it back on, your body sort of has to get used to the level. So if I were to turn this off right now for an hour and then just turn it right back on on level 3.0, oh my God, I'd be in pain. Like it would be way too much like that shocking feeling that I'm talking about. It would feel like that. It would be really painful and I'd be like desperately turning it down really fast. Okay, so I did try on camera just a second ago to see if I could turn it up to where you could see my feet flexing, but I couldn't turn it up high enough because I got up to like 3.6 and it started hurting and I'm not gonna hurt myself to try and get my toe to flex a little bit. But if anyone has ever used like a TENS unit or anything like that, it's, it's the same logic basically. If you put a TENS unit on certain parts, why I know this is ridiculous. We had one as, my parents, my mom had one when we were little and we used to play with it and we weren't supposed to. But we'd put it like right here on our arm and our hands would like close in, like your fingers would like pull in. And that's basically what it is. So that stimulator in my sacral nerve pulls my foot up for some reason. I don't know, but that's it. So I guess that's really, the gist of it. Um, again, I have to get the battery changed every five to seven years. I think I got this two years ago, three years ago, and they said the battery had already been drained um, quite a bit, but they said they, th they think I still had like another two years out of it, so it could be closer to four years for me, which is fine. Um, they said that's totally normal. Five to seven is just sort of the average. So basically I'll go and I'll get the battery changed and the battery is about this size and it's about that flat actually. So this kind of mirrors the battery that's in my back. Um, if I can find, I, I definitely can, I'll find a picture of it and I'll put it in here if I remember. Um, but it's a cool little device and like I said, it has helped me so much. So if you have dealt with UTIs your whole life, if you've dealt with insane bladder frequency, male or female, um, female if you've dealt with pain, um, like sometimes you can have pain during intercourse. Um, I'm lucky I don't really have that much. Sometimes I'll have a little bit afterwards or something or um, starting out or something. It can be a little bit painful, but it's totally like... I'm really lucky I have a husband that totally understands and um, I do everything medically I can for it because I wanna have a sex life too. Um, but luckily mine is not bad. Apparently a lot of people have horrible pain during sex, like they're in tears. I've never had that at all. I'm so lucky that I haven't had that. I'll just every once in a while maybe have a little bit of that spasming feeling so that can be difficult, but it's no big deal for me. It's not painful. Um, but yeah, if you deal with that at all, if you feel like you don't understand what's going on with your bladder, if you notice that when you drink, oh, that's another thing too, before I end this. One of the deciding factors that made my doctor do another bladder scope back in 2010 and see if I had interstitial cystitis was that he asked me about drinking cranberry juice. So most people when they have bladder issues or UTIs, that you, people tell you to drink cranberry juice. 
because if you have a normal bladder, cranberry juice is very good for your urinary tract. It helps cleanse out the bacteria. I think it's got probiotics in it. So it gets out the bad bacteria and puts in the good bacteria. But if you have interstitial cystitis, cranberry juice makes it so much worse because it's acidic. So it's swelling all those cysts. It's not so much that you have a urinary tract issue. It's not that you have a buildup of bacteria just in your urinary tract for no reason. It's that you can't empty your bladder, that what's in it basically can build up bacteria, and then it's not cleansing through your urinary tract and you get a UTI. And they asked me that. I remember dealing with horrible UTIs before I got diagnosed and they asked me, you know, have you tried drinking cranberry juice? And I said, yeah, but weirdly, I kind of feel like it makes it worse when I drink cranberry juice. And they said that was my next question. So that also, if you have these issues and you notice that is a problem, I would definitely go see a urologist about it or your primary care physician and ask them. Um, but yeah, and if you need a recommendation, my doctor is fantastic. I love her to death. She moved practices and I moved with her. Like, she's not losing me now. I'm sticking with her because she's a specialist in interstitial cystitis, which a lot of urologists aren't. A lot of people don't quite know fully about it yet. And she's also a specialist in the inner stem device. So I am sticking with her forever, basically. <laughs> so yeah, if you need a recommendation, if you need any more information, feel free to comment below. Um, please like, this video and subscribe. Um, I don't think I'm gonna do any more medical videos, but I thought this would be good because again, I didn't have any information really when I went to get my inner stem device done. So um, yeah, if you need any more information, hit me up and that's it. Thanks for watching guys.